Good evening. And uh, thank you very much and welcome and uh, for coming out tonight. Um, it's very somewhat, a little bit warmer than usual, but still chilly uh, January <laughs> evening. Um, this is our uh, community, community conversation. Uh, we're called Community Conversation 2.0. This is uh, an opportunity for us to uh, come back after a few years of uh, Thrive 2027 uh, getting started and really sort of not only check in with you all about what things what has been happening with Thrive 2027, uh, but also uh, hear from you about some of the issues that are important to you. In terms of what, uh, and <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I do this every time. My name is Ronald Jarrett, and I'm Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at United Way of Greater Portland. Um, and so the purpose of this evening is really to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, come together to have a conversation. We're going to do a number of interactive activities tonight. Um, and so the, uh, the program uh, is going to go until about 7 o'clock. And uh, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to hear from Ann Dalton, who's going to be sharing with us uh, Ann Dalton is on our Thrive 2027 Council and will be sharing with us um, her experiences on the Council and what it means to her. Uh, we're going to uh, do a little exercise with the Mentimeter. And for those of you who don't know, I'm not going to spoil it. It's quite an experience. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Uh, we're going to uh, talk to, we're going to hear from uh, Senator Millett uh, about LD 1760. And that is uh, a really important, well, I'm going to save it for, for her talk. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really interesting bill that a lot of folks are supporting to advance, uh, to expand access to quality child care. Um, and so this is quite a, a piece of legislation. And uh, we're going to have an opportunity. As a matter of fact, can I see a show of hands? Who brought their cell phone with them? Excellent. And of those folks with their hands up, who likes to send text messages? Great. So we're going to do a little uh, activity in which you will be able to uh, actually do a little bit of advocacy using your phone. And it takes 30 seconds. But I'm going to uh, save that until we get into that later. And also, um, we're going to do a little bit of a breakout session, which is one of the reasons why I try to encourage folks to, to sit up front and around these tables, because uh, it'll be a chance in small groups to hear from each other. Uh, what are some of the things that, some of the issues in, your, in the community, as well as uh, what do you think we, uh, as a community, should be doing about some of these issues, among others. Um, and then we're going to wrap up and have a little bit of a reception where folks can, if you haven't already, do a bit of uh, networking and also an opportunity to ask us questions, some of the folks around the room. So um, one of the things I want to uh, share, and the Mentimeter is going to be next, is um, you know, more than three years ago, uh, folks came together in hopes of ensuring Cumberland County is a thriving community. And the goal setting process was overseen by the Greater Portland Community-wide Goal Setting Council. And this was representing many different voices. Uh, across the community, across the county. And a cornerstone of this process were 90 community conversations where we had with over 1,500 people and we received over 550 responses to an online survey. And basically, those conversations, we asked three questions. What kind of community do you want? What's stopping us from having that community? And what would make a difference? Now, uh, three additional volunteer groups assess community needs and aspirations. And using local data, uh, we were able to and input from the community conversations and surveys uh, and strategies and looking at strategies that worked in other communities like ours. Uh, we were able to create um, the, the goal, the councils and, and the cabinets were able to create uh, three goals uh, that really guide the work that we're doing here. Uh, the first goal being giving kids a strong start. The second one is empowering neighbors to thrive, not just survive. And the third one being help us all live longer and better. And so um, one of the things I want to do is uh, we're going to pull up the Mentimeter. If you have your phone with you, if you can go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I.com, and you're going to use, you're going to put in the code 146482. So the first question is, what inspired you to be here today? So what inspired you to be here today? Thank you. you can. Education, opportunity, community seems to be the big one connection, child care access, and information. These are all um, a lot of the reasons why folks came together around Thrive 2027 in the, in the beginning. And then it's really great to see that this is why we're all here today. And I believe there's a second question. All right. We've got a lot of really interesting answers here. Um, <laughs> a lot. That's great. Community-guided goals, awesome. 
So as we see, there's a lot of different things. Almost as many people as are in the room have different um, understanding of Thrive 2027. And to help folks understand this a little bit um, better, uh, I <laughs> dug up the video that uh, was created in response to the, um, the initial launch of Thrive 2027. It's less than five minutes, and if we can cue that up. Good morning, everybody. Couldn't think of a better day to be celebrating what we're about to celebrate. We've really worked hard in the process elements of this to make sure it was as inclusive a process as possible. I think we would all agree that Greater Portland is a great place to live and work. I think we would also agree that some people are not doing well. For example, today, 770 Cumberland County third graders do not read at grade level. Today, more than half of our neighbors don't have sufficient resources for housing and other necessities. And today, like in the rest of America, our citizens with major mental illnesses are dying anywhere from 13 to 32 years younger than the rest of the general population. You know, Greater Portland and Cumberland County are great places to live, but given these statistics, it's clear that we can do better, and we must do better, and we can, but only if we work together toward a shared vision and engage new voices in support of a set of shared goals. If we put people at the center of all our work, combine our individual and collective efforts, and engage new voices, we can make one lasting change in our community. Together we can make Greater Portland known as a place where everyone thrives. And that's why we're all here today, to announce 10-year community-wide goals for Greater Portland. Goal one is that every child has quality learning experiences beginning at birth. And this is an absolutely critical goal because we all know that our kids are going to be leading our community tomorrow, and we need them healthy, educated, and resilient. It's going to take all of us to ensure that even our youngest kids in Greater Portland have a strong start so that they can read proficiently by the end of third grade, because that is the mark when kids stop learning to read and switch over to reading to learn, which makes this an absolutely critical benchmark for lifelong success. Goal two is that individuals and families have the education, employment opportunities, and resources to achieve financial stability. Because we know that when people have the education and employment opportunities to become financially stable, they can pay their rent on time, and they can put food on the table. They're also better able to save for emergencies, buy a house, pay for college, and save for retirement. And this is why we need to all work together to ensure that more individuals and families in Greater Portland are financially secure and provide them with the educational and employment opportunities that they need. And finally, the goal three is that children and adults will have the resources and opportunities they need to achieve optimal healthy lives. Today, too many lives are cut short due to barriers to health, such as untreated mental illness, substance abuse, abuse disorders and domestic violence, and that's why we need to work to ensure that everyone in Greater Portland and Cumberland County has the opportunities to lead healthy lives and do all that we can to reduce preventable early deaths. On behalf of United Way of Greater Portland's Board of Directors, I am delighted to announce that we voted just this morning to align our efforts behind and endorse Thrive 2027.
building and for every organization, whether that's a company or whether that's a service club or whether that's a book group, we really want everybody to feel that they have a way that they can contribute. We need everyone who cares about this community to get involved and stay involved. We need people, we need businesses, we need systems, we need organizations, we need everyone. But if we can do this, and we believe we can, we will, in fact, thrive in 2027. On behalf of the United Way Greater Portland staff and our board of directors, we are absolutely excited to be part of this initiative and leading this initiative today. And, you know, we said today that we're all in, and today the, the people, members of the community who came out today showed us that they're all in, and we know that that momentum is just going to build and build and build. And together we are going to make an amazing something really exciting and we'll all be proud that we were here today in Congress Square Park on this beautiful day uh, to celebrate that. You know, I've been with uh, United Way of Greater Portland for about two years and have been a resident of Portland, Maine for, wow, almost, almost four. And, um, you know, I, the, I haven't watched this video in quite some time, but after having been here for a while and doing this work, it is really inspiring to see the fact, to, to, to see the fact that so many different people from all over the region came together and to focus on three key goals that we know are actually going to move the needle and make life better for all of us. Um, some of us may not be some of the folks who are the ben beneficiaries, or rather the recipients of some of the support that whether our volunteer time, our community investments, or our advocacy helps to, um, helps to support. Uh, but we all benefit from this work, and, um, and I think that's something that we should acknowledge uh, because it's, it's really important that, that the, the power of compassion, uh, of empathy, but also of creating uh, reachable goals and creating reachable programs and policies um, and efforts to affect this are so important and um, so needed. And so I just want to uh, thank, first of all, uh, Ann Dalton uh, for being a part of this uh, event. Uh, Ann is a senior leader with the Association of Junior Leagues International. And previously, she was uh, with a Girls Club of New York. She was executive director there. Um, Henry Street Settlement, she was Henry Street Settlement's Director of Youth Employment Services and Senior Planner with the Vera Institute uh, for, of Justice. Anne holds a BA in English from Cornell University and an MSW from Hunter College and is a graduate of the Carver Policy Governance Academy and the Institute for Civic Leadership's Leadership in Intensive. She is a sustaining member of the Junior League of Portland and Secretary of the Board of Portland uh, Public Library. <laughs> um, she's a board member of the United Way of Greater Portland and a member of Thrive 2027 Council. And just want to introduce, thank you very much, Anne, for being here and sharing with us your experience. Thank you, Ronald. But most importantly, thank all of you for um, hanging in there and really being interested in where we're going with Thrive 2027. I've been asked to sort of reflect on three different aspects. Partly, you know, why do I support Thrive? I have to confess, I was in at the very beginning on the Goals Council. What am I the proudest about in terms of what we've accomplished so far? And then bringing it down a little bit to more specifically um, what we're going to talk about later tonight, how does goal two, which I am the co-chair of, that's the financial stability goal, how does that goal connect with the issue of ACEs? Um, why do I support Thrive? Thrive is fundamentally to me, it's about how we show up together as a community. It's about inviting all who are interested to participate regardless of which sector you come from. It affirms that if we harness our efforts together and set specific goals, we all benefit. For Thrive Today, that's about everyone having a good start in school, the ability to enjoy financial stability, and the opportunity for us all to be healthier. But the facts are that not everyone in Cumberland County um, actually enjoys those benefits today. And as a result, all of us who live here are negatively affected. What Thrive offers is a community-built and data-driven way of tackling these persistent challenges. It's about doing things differently that I think notably sets Thrive 2027 apart. 
I think I'm proudest to go all the way back to the beginning and being incredibly heartened by the interest in the across Cumberland County when we did the first set of community conversations that Ronald referenced earlier that led very significantly and very directly to the identification of those goals. Today, there are over 270 businesses, nonprofits, and government groups that have endorsed those goals, and of that number, over 140 have agreed to work together to achieve one or more of the outcomes. It's the willingness to come together and work differently to achieve the goals that I think is perhaps the most inspiring about our work. So what about goal two and ACEs? I think we all tend to think of ACEs as something that happens only to children. And yet, without appropriate interventions and support, a child experiencing ACEs will grow to be an adult who still suffers from those adverse circumstances. That, in turn, means a greater likelihood that that adult will have difficulty successfully obtaining employment and being financially stable. So goal two sees ACEs both from the perspective of supporting efforts at early detection and prevention that are primarily being addressed more specifically in goals one and goal three, as well as from the perspective of how an adult who experienced ACEs as a child needs to be supported to achieve financial stability. So that's why I'm involved with Thrive 2027, and thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you, Anne. And so um, one of the things that we wanted to do next, uh, we have uh, one more little Mentimeter exercise. Once again, we have a number of different answers here. Um, brain development is definitely an interesting one around, especially with regards to adverse childhood experiences and some of the solutions around that. And we'll be able to talk a bit about some of the A policy. Um, that we're looking to do around this. So, there's another question. So, moving past goals, actual Im implementation is definitely um, an important, an important subject, an important question. Data is definitely a key part of this. We can talk more about that. And concrete strategies and implementation. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at is. Well, as, um, as Anne mentioned, uh, you know, we realize that adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, um, is connected to so many of the, of the challenges that we're trying to impact. And um, you know, one, of the, the, so one solution for, for decreasing the instances of adverse childhood experiences uh, is for a child to be in a high quality, safe, and affordable early care and education program. So recognizing this need uh, and the need for meaningful workforce development, some of our legislators, uh, including Senator Rebecca Millett, uh, have co-sponsored LD1760. This is an act to support children's health, healthy development and school readiness. Um, and so uh, I just want to uh, first of all say thank you, Senator Millett, for, for being here tonight. Um, and you know, Senator Rebecca Millett is uh, the state senator uh, for uh, Maine's 29th district, and this includes South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and parts of Scarborough. Now, uh, she currently is, is Senate Chair of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee and is serving her fourth and final term uh, in the legislature. Uh, from 2004 to 2010, she, uh, Senator Millett served on the Cape Elizabeth School Board um, and, and she grew up uh, <laughs> in Portland and attended area public schools. She earned her BA and BS from American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, and her MBA in Finance from the University of Chicago. And so I'd like to uh, introduce you all to Senator Rebecca Millett. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I have been on the Education Committee my full um, time in the state legislature. From my, uh, my very first two years, I was actually the Senate chair, which was an interesting experience because I'd never been in the legislature before. Um, and in the next four years, I was in the minority, but I was the minority lead on the committee, and now I'm back to being Senate chair. So there's a certain amount of, um, uh, what am I trying to say, synchronicity to that. We spend a lot of time in the education committee talking about why our kids aren't, uh, why aren't all of our kids able to be successful. And it's been very interesting to see the progress of the discussion from my first year to where we are now. 
And uh, last session in particular, countless bills came before us trying to um, get at early childhood experiences and social emotional learning. There is a much greater understanding that um, what schools are experiencing is actually a continuation from the child's earliest life experiences. Um, so this bill is a recognition that uh, every child's experience is unique. Every opportunity, every barrier is, unique, is pretty much unique to each child. And there is no one magic approach um, in helping that child thrive. Um, there's a bunch of these in the back which explain um, kind of the overarching approach um, that this bill has. And it's basically for, oh, there we go, four different areas. Um, families. If a child's family life is um, unstable, unhealthy, <clears throat> it's no surprise then really that they're going to come to school um, with some serious uh, setbacks. And we're recognizing that child care providers, early education providers are a really great way to uh, meet them where they are and try to get in early and quickly to improve their situation. This is all modeled um, against the Educare model. How many people know about Educare? So a, a good amount. Um, Educare is a, is a model that's been implemented across the country um, and it very much reflects this approach. It's very expensive and the Educare, there's one Educare, um, actual Educare facility in the state of Maine in Waterville and um, while it has this amazingly beautiful, fantastic um, set up for child care for children, it's also a training facility as well. And they bring in lots of providers and agencies to come in and see what they're doing in hopes of spreading some of these best practices. But we're re in recognition that we don't have the money to build an Educare in every community across the state of Maine. So a number of, uh, two or th I'm losing track of time, maybe four years ago, um, with the help of MELIG, which is the main early learning investment group, which is a group of businesses, um, partnered with Educare Maine to try um, kind of a hub and spoke system, which is to say, you are not going to build an Educare in Skowhegan, but we are going to provide technical assistance to Skowhegan in hopes that we can help better support the child care providers um, and agencies in that community. And it's worked really well. So this bill is to try to take that model and now create 10, 10 <laughs> um, pilot programs around the state. So we've had one, it worked really well, and now we want to scale it up to 10. Um, so you're working, so these, these facilities work with the families. Um, if there is an unemployment issue, if there's a transportation issue, if there's a mental health issue, um, they have the ability to put those families in contact with whatever necessary resources that they may need. Um, it's working with the early educators and saying, we, we recognize that your job's really tough. Um, you know, like we have been hearing a lot about expulsions of young children from child care centers because they are coming in with some serious behavioral challenges. And our, our, early, our child care providers are um, not necessarily trained in how to deal with those kind of presentations of, of um, behavioral issues. So um, this model would provide that assistance as well to the um, early educators. And then of course, obviously, the children in this environment really thrive um, because their, their parents are hopefully healthier. Um, and, uh, and sometimes the parents come into these with, with job issues 
and um, the centers can help them with that as well. We had a young, uh, young, gosh, it's a sign of my age now. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, a woman who was in her, um, probably in her 30s, who did not have a job and was struggling to make ends meet. And so poverty is one of the leading aces, right? Well, I think we all know that. Um, and so they worked with her to get um, training to become an early child care provider herself, uh, which is really fantastic. And you could just see how proud she was of the journey that she had taken. And you know for sure that that is going to then reflect back into her family life um, in their house. So that's what the bill is. And um, our hope is, is that we are going to um, find the money in this round of um, budgetary discussions. It, it helps when the Senate president is the lead co-sponsor and um, had the opportunity to see the Educare model in person and interact with the, the, the children and the providers. And um, he's drinking the same Kool-Aid that I drank about six years ago. Um, everything falls from this. All of our workforce development issues our opioid epidemic issues, um, I mean, you name it. It comes from how these kids experience life in those first incredibly important de de developmental years. And the good news is, after at least four years of um, the U.S. military, retired military coming in, our law enforcement officers coming in, our business leaders coming in and talking to the legislature over and over again about why this is not a partisan issue, this is a main issue. Um, it's, not a bar, it's not a partisan issue anymore. It, it's, we now have a, ch a children's caucus that um, I co-founded with um, then Republican Representative uh, Matt Pouliot. Um, now my, my co-chair is Sawin Millett. Um, he is a long-standing Republican um, uh, leader within the State House, uh, so so that's really great news. But the real this costs money. Everything costs money, and so it's about making this a priority uh, above all the other really important priorities. But in terms of the return on investment, this is one of the, our favorite ways of getting our uh, more conservative colleagues. It's one of the best that you can have. I think it's like between 6 and 12% or something like that has been the various studies. So I think I'm going to wrap up there, and I'm happy to answer any questions that, that folks may, may have about this project. Um, we, there will be a public hearing in, in February. We, it hasn't been quite set yet. But um, I really hope that folks will consider supporting um, this bill, um, lending your voice to it. The more, the better. Um, while indeed it's great to have the president of the Senate, we are a bicameral legislature, and we have a governor who um, you know, has lots of competing interests as well. So the more unified we are with our voices, then we can bring everybody to that same place of support, um, the better chances we have of getting this passed. Any questions? We have a few minutes for questions. No? So, um, I'm part of the Women United Child Care Advocacy Committee, so very excited to hear about this bill. I'm also, in the last month, I've been at a, an event where I heard the main community colleges talk about lack of, of support and the additional funding for community college education. I've, been at community meetings and for the Portland Public Schools talking about drastic changes that don't even come close to covering the budget cuts. I'm curious, and this is like a, an uneducated question, so are there other bills that are also education focused that the legislature is considering that like, this is competing with, or is oh, yeah. it collectively, like how, yeah. how is education as a whole being viewed in the legislature? Um, yeah, we've spent a lot of money on education in the state of Maine. It's a huge chunk of our budget. Um, statutorily, Maine is, the state of Maine is required to fund 55% of the total cost of public education, right? And we have not met that goal 
um, since the referendum was passed for its second or third time, I can't remember. Um, but we are getting closer and closer, and but to get, like so for one percent increase, it's like a forty or fifty million dollar investment. But when you do that, then more money flows into the overall education system. We have a very complicated methodology, so Portland often does not get as much um, as others because of property rates and how um, it, can, it, ha it can raise more funds with its mill rate than a place like Rumford. Right? So in terms of it, it's still, relatively speaking, it gets a lot of money maybe, you know, 8 million, 10 million, 12 million, whatever, but as a percentage of the overall budget, it's very small, whereas Rumford probably gets, it probably gets less than what Portland does, but it's a bigger chunk of its budget. Um, so lots of, everybody hates the funding formula, and so for me, that's a sign that it's working. <laughs> because every, it's, yeah, it's, it's designed to send money to where, where the, the economy is not as strong and they can't raise their own funds because we rely very heavily on property tax. But there's, there's that constant conversation about funding, the, the state funding total public education. And we're making headway. Um, there's funding um, requirements for our career and tech education centers. That's in the mix. There's funding requests for uh, supporting social emotional learning coaches. Uh, there's funding requests for increasing the uh, rate of reimbursement for our early child care providers. And I, the list goes on and on. The community colleges system, the university main system. Uh, they didn't get everything they wanted, but they got an increase. Um, and, and are any, they're all worthy. But, you know, we had three rounds of tax cuts in a row between with legislatures and we basically eliminated around 240 million dollars of state revenue in a biennium 240 million dollars that has a real impact on what our capacity is um, and that's that's one of the elephants in the room when we, it's really great to have goals, it's really great to bring everybody together and agree that this is important, but, but um, at some point we have to say, we can't fund all of this. So who are we going to say no to? Um, or are we going to start talking about tax reform? So, I hope that answered your question. Thanks. In light of the other question, to add on, what are the three main priorities for the Children's Caucus? I understand that the first for me is one of them, but what are the other priorities? Well, actually, um, we have not, this session we have not gotten to the point of um, deciding what our priorities are. Um, we did that last session, and I apologize. My brain is mush today. I cannot remember what the prior. I, actually, the social-emotional coaches got funded last year. And that was one of our priorities. Um, so that was really good news. But yeah, we are actually in the process. We have a um, couple more um, informational presentations from the, um, the administration and some outside groups. And then we're going to start doing the heavy lifting of deciding what our priorities are. Does that mean that they're going to get funded? Um, no. But it helps when you have the Republican lead for the Appropriations and Financials Affair committee as your co-chair. So as you saw, um, we ha there is a bill um, that's picking up a little moment, picking up a quite a bit of momentum uh, into in supporting um, expansion of early care and education as well as supporting workforce development. All the things that we know are going to positively impact um, the efforts that we're making uh, to overcome quite a few of these challenges. So one of the things that we uh, you know, Senator Millett mentioned about having all of our voices together. And um, I want to see a show of hands. Who here has ever written a letter to your legislator? Or made a phone call? Okay. 
So a good number of folks here. So one of the things that uh, we're, we are doing is making it very easy for folks to get up to speed on some of the bills that are happening that, we're, that, that, are, that Thrive 2027 is supporting, uh, but also make it easy for folks to actually advocate. And so uh, for the last time, if you can pull out your, your, your cell phone and, uh, and if you can text the word me child, or main child, M-E, second word child, to the number 52886, you should receive a prompt. This will allow you to write a personalized letter with some talking points and, and prompts to your specific legislator. See some folks already doing it, that's awesome. And what we've seen is that they actually get these emails and they actually read them and most likely you will get a response. Um, a num uh, yes, awesome. So yes, so advocating, as you can see, can be very easy and straightforward.